So as everybody has mentioned, we're now able to treat the entire spectrum of osteoarthritis by combining the principles of both joint preservation and joint restoration. We've got the tools to think beyond just osteotomy versus total knee. So here's a typical patient that many of us see in our office. It's maybe 45 to 50 year old active individual with a history of knee problems, maybe a chronic ACL deficiency, maybe some patellofemoral symptoms that we're trying to evaluate. And you know, this is a challenging problem. And as I transformed into doing some unis just a couple of years ago, you know, when I saw this patient, I was concerned about the ACL deficiency and the patellofemoral symptoms and uh, remembering back from residency that maybe that was a contraindication to do in a uni. So I think we've traditionally had some slightly different approaches based on our uh, fellowship training. I think a typical sports medicine trained surgeon would think immediately of an HTO, plus or minus an ACL reconstruction, maybe a chondroplasty or a microfracture for the trochlea. Whereas a joint trained surgeon uh, might avoid the uni, uh, maybe think about a total knee or maybe say that they're too young for a total knee at this point. I think most surgeons are hesitant to do unis if there's an ACL deficiency or if there's cartilage defects in the other compartment, and we commonly see these in the patellofemoral compartment. ACL deficiency traditional recommendations, again, have been either a HTO and ACL reconstruction in younger patients versus a TKA in the older patients, but we still have that middle range of patients that we don't have very good solutions for in the past. Other surgeons, such as Ng, recommended not doing an uni with a ACL deficiency. This is a, a robotic cadaveric study uh, by Suggs. It was published in 2004, uh, looking at the ACL deficient knee after a uni, which showed significantly greater anterior tibial translations than the native knee. They also noted that a functional ACL is necessary to ensure normal stability after a unicompartmental arthroplasty. In a follow-up study, they showed that ACL transection after the uni shifted the femur posteriorly compared to the intact and the uni knees. It also showed increased internal rotation of the tibia, and that the AP motion of the articular contact position the implant was increased after an ACL transection. They concluded that this may explain the mechanism for tibial component loosening. This study in 2012 was in JBJS, the British edition, where they had a 93% implant survival at five years and 52% that had an ACL reconstruction with a unicompartmental replacement. They didn't note the exact number of uh, patients, but some of these had their ACLs done in a staged fashion instead of doing them simultaneously. So about two or three years ago when I started making this transformation over to uh, doing some unis, I had a patient that came in with an ACL deficient knee in the x-ray that I showed at the beginning. And based on my uh, experience with Arthrex and doing lots of all inside ACL reconstruction since about 2005, I said, well, there's no reason that we can't do an ACL reconstruction with this uni. We, it's a minimally invasive procedure with small sockets that we create. It's a fast procedure, and we've got allografts that are already pre-contoured for this procedure. So I think around the same time, Tommy probably was doing the same thing. Now, he's done far more than I have in the interim, but the nice thing about this graft balance technique, and that's what the technique is called, where we combine the ACL reconstruction with the uni. It's a single stage procedure. It uses the eye balance uni, which is a great uh, design that you've already heard about, and the graft link ACL reconstruction. It's minimally invasive. It's bone sparing because we create small sockets instead of bone tunnels. We can use a pre-sutured uh, allograft from LifeNet that makes the process much easier. You don't have to harvest uh, the patient's own tissue, and it speeds up the procedure for you because it's pre-sutured. So, in general, we start off with the arthroscopic procedure. You can evaluate all of the compartments and then you move straight to the ACL reconstruction. With the guides and techniques available, this is a very reproducible procedure. Uh, we have the retro reconstruction guides here. We can create a small socket in the femur 
As uh, Tommy mentioned, for the lateral uni, we do this after preparing the ephemeral condyles with the bone cuts. We don't want to do it too early uh, because that can, uh, the uh, sockets can be cut by the bony cuts and then you wouldn't have a full socket. So we want to wait until after the bone cuts. But for the medial uni, which is again the most common, we can proceed with our femoral socket and we go right to a tibial socket. We're going to make this slightly more vertical uh, for the medial unis than we would otherwise because we don't want to undermine the bone. We're going to dock our sutures in our anterolateral compartment and now we're ready to proceed with our incision for the uni. The biggest uh, caveat here is other than the standard uh, technique, you want to really pay attention to your vertical tibial cut for the medial unis. You, you want to go to the midpoint between the top and the bottom of the medial tibial eminence. You want to use caution, avoiding cutting into the ACL attachment point or, the so or where you're going to have your socket on the tibial side. And sometimes an electrocautery device is helpful in marking this. This is kind of what it looks like right here. This is our cut surface. You can see the uh, medial tibial eminence in here. Here's our tibial socket that we've created. It's slightly more vertical, so it's not undermining the cut surface of the tibia. So then you're going to proceed with your normal uh, eye balance uh, procedure with all your cuts. You're going to implant it. This picture shows it with the poly, but we're going to generally use the trial poly first while we're passing the ACL graft. Here's the graft link construct with the tightrope here. And those of you that are not familiar with this, we basically pass this graft into the socket and then as we pull the limbs of this tightrope suture, it's going to pull the graft all the way into the socket. So it's a one size fits all as compared to some of the other continuous loop buttons that you may be familiar with. We can customize this and we can have a very small socket. You only need about 15 millimeters of graft in the socket. And then the same thing on the tibial side, we're going to uh, pull the tibial end of the graft through here and we have a tightrope with the uh, ABS button, which is something we attach to the sutures once it's been passed, and we can uh, secure this down very tightly with the uh, trial implant, uh, trial uh, tray in place. We're going to go into full extension and tighten our graft, and then we can uh, go to the permanent poly at that point. Here's Tommy's picture here. Um, again, we've got the uh, uni right here and here's the ACL graft sitting nicely next to it. You can see there's room between the tibial portion and the tray right there so there's no impingement. This was a 45 year old patient that I did the graft balance on. Three months post-op he twisted his knee and actually developed a lateral meniscus tear which concerned me because um, I was concerned about his ACL graft maybe not functioning. His exam was benign. Uh, wasn't really able to do an MRI because of the uh, uni causing distortion. So we did a second look where I treated his lateral meniscus tear and here you can see his ACL three months looks very good. He's got full range of motion here and uh, the graft is completely intact and functional and there we get a little look at his uh, uni which uh, performed fine. We took care of the lateral meniscectomy and he went on to do very well. So what about cartilage defects in other compartments? You know, most commonly we'll see these patients that have some patellofemoral symptoms and, you know, in the past have always been cautious about uh, treating those with the uni, although a lot of the literature does show that if you treat these patients uh, with their uni, they usually do okay in the patellofemoral compartment, even if they have some crepitus and not significant symptoms. Uh, but now as we have more and more tools uh, in terms of soft tissue and cartilage reconstruction, I think we have other options for those with the grade 3 and 4 chondral defects and certainly those with the frank osteoarthritis may be considerations for a bicondyl or replacement, especially with the uh, design of the patellofemoral uh, prosthesis. I think that would work really nicely. The biocartilage is a dehydrated allograft cartilage. Uh, particulates that are 100 to 300, 300 microns in size and they have the extracellular matrix of cartilage that helps to serve as a scaffold for bone marrow cells and so the procedure is done with a microfracture uh, first followed by uh, insertion of the biocartilage. It comes in a particulate form that you mix on the back table with uh, ACP, PRP uh, or uh, bone marrow concentrate and this is actually an arthroscopic 
uh, view of uh, a patient that I did this for, just so you can see what the procedure looks like. Obviously with the uni, you would be doing this open. Uh, this is a 36 year old female with a grade four femoral defect. So we've uh, placed, you gotta do this with the knee dry. So it uh, you know, makes the visualization a little more difficult, but you can get a Gemini cannula in there to pull away the soft tissue and then an articulated uh, paddle to kind of smooth that out. And then some Evaseal or Tevaseal uh, fibrin glue. Uh, what we've learned is using the uh, uh, the double lumen cannulas for the fibrin glue makes it a little bit easier. You don't get uh, as much of the glue going onto the uh, surrounding surfaces. Here you can see we have a little piece that's stuck to the, uh, the synovium there and you want to go in with some uh, scissors to remove that away. You let this uh, dry and then you take the knee through a range of motion. Um, once it's cured, make sure that everything is stable. That's what it uh, looks like arthroscopically. Uh, again, this is Dr. Campbell's uh, picture. So a uni has been done here and there's a trochlear defect that is uh, near full thickness. And so we're gonna prepare the uh, biocartilage and then insert it in place. And then you can do the fibrin glue uh, in an open fashion, which is much easier than arthroscopic, but um, it gets you a nice treatment of your trochlear defect and your uh, medial compartment arthrosis. So um, this is a patient where you maybe in the past would have thought that a uni was contraindicated and uh, we have the tools to be able to do that. Here's a cardiform case with, uh, this is a hyaline cartilage. It maintains its cell viability. It has a shelf life. The nice thing is that it conforms to the chondral surfaces and we can insert these with small uh, anchors, bio uh, suture tack anchors and push lock fixation and it nicely contours to the irregular surface of the trochlea. The main options then in biocartilage are for contained defects where the subchondral bone is intact. It's an extracellular matrix scaffold, has a, a five-year shelf life, and it's ideal for small lesions versus the cartiform. For contained and con uncontained defects, the subchondral bone needs to be intact or mostly intact two-year shelf life and can be used for small to large lesions. And certainly if you have a significant subchondral bone loss, then you're gonna move on to an allograph. Orthobiologics, ACP, PRP, and bone marrow concentrate. I use these uh, in as many of my procedures as possible. Mainly the PRP and the BMC, I soak my graft link uh, ACL graft in these. Use it for biocartilage prep and injection to the joint after uh, cartiform. So in conclusion, by merging the principles of joint preservation, orthobiologics, and joint restoration permits us to treat the entire spectrum of knee osteoarthritis.